So uh, where David is talking about uh, you know, all kinds of environmental factors and sociology, the cultural aspect of mushrooms uh, and, uh, and so many other things, uh, I'm gonna really focus on what happens after we eat the mushroom, when it goes into our body and why, why eat more mushrooms? And well, there's of course, as soon as we, it starts in our mind, doesn't it? The psychology of eating mushrooms, we were talking about that. But um, just the idea of getting out in the forest. And to me, if you're talking about the healing power of mushrooms, <clears throat> the first step is just to get out in the woods. And, and it's just so uh, healing and so much medicine just being in the woods. I walked up yesterday up the trail here into the Aspen Forest and I could just really feel the, um, so much uh, energy coming from these trees and the, the whole environment. It really is a, uh, a web. So the mushrooms are part of a web. We're, we're discovering that more and more, how complex the web is, but, but how important the fung fungi are for the health of the forest the health of all organisms in the forest because they're also recycling the trees and making the carbon and other nutrients available, as David already said, uh, to all these other creatures. So they are an integral part, a, a crucial part to the health of our planet. They've been around for a billion years. They, they used to, we used to think that they, you know, they could find fossils of fungi from 600 million years ago, then it went to 800 and now they've found uh, fungi back really deep cores one billion years ago there were already fungi so they have been around not as long as the green plants which which uh, cyanobacteria they found the first ones from about three billion years ago even before the great oxidation event but fungi have been around for a long long time and really they're part of our I, I just have to think that they're part of our metabolism we are definitely breathing in fungal spores and bacteria and, and viruses, so um, the wild type bacteria and fungi and other microorganisms that we breathe in, that we eat every day. I just saw a study the other day on uh, where they were testing produce to see after you know the produce in the store and, and they did DNA um, testing on all these different types of produce and grains and other things in a store and they found tons of bacteria on there so there's Pretty, pretty complex microflora in, the, in our vegetables <coughs> and food, uh, and also fungi. They found quite a few fungal species in there as well. So we, we do have a resident fungal uh, microbiota, and of course there's lots of bacteria as we know. And believe it or not, this really blew me away. There are literally estimated to be over two trillion different, uh, not different, but two trillion viral um, particles or viruses living in our body, two trillion. And where are they? We think about, well, where are all those? Well, they're all inside the, the, the bacteria. They live in the bacteria and they're regulating the bacteria. And nowadays we know that there's a super highway between the gut and the brain, the vagal nerve, but other pathways as well. And so the, the whole point, and this, this goes right into fungi, the whole point is that the, probably the most important aspect to our health that we're just now starting to really research is the diversity and complexity of our microbiota is really what informs how much health, it, you know, how, um, what the role that it's going to play in reducing uh, chronic illnesses and how it's going to um, increase our, the effectiveness of our immune function to protect us against pathogens and also our mood, regulate our mood and probably many other functions, blood pressure and, and so forth. Another really amazing fact that I learned recently is that, um, that bacteria and fungi can, can synthesize an amazing array of, of um, active compounds that our body uses to regulate itself. Even neurotransmitters like serotonin, 80 to 90% of our body's serotonin comes from our microflora. It actually synthesizes that and then it starts you know, traveling around our body. And it's one of the major neurotransmitters in our body which affects our, our appetite, our sleep, uh, and many, many other functions. So these microorganisms, the wild type that we're eating, and I have to think that if we're eating fungi, um, that you know, that's part of the process getting out in, in the forest. Of course, we're cooking them. Um, but they're compounds also. 
The compounds in mushrooms are mainly of three types, the active compounds of mushrooms. First of all, all the polymers that we find in the cell wall, such as beta-glucans, which are very complex hydrocarbon, carbon, or hy hydrocarbon, sorry, carbohydrates. And um, so they're glucans, they're, seri they're chains of glucose molecules, but they're highly branched and they're very, very particular to fungi. And each species of fungi can produce different types of beta-glucans. Well, beta, it turns out that we have this ancient recognition system for beta-glucans. And the other, a couple of the other polymers are chitin. Chitin is, a, is found in crab shells. So it's an amino glycan that is also very complex. Those also are found in the cell wall of fungi. And they're, these, the beta-glucans and the other, and the, there are some alpha-glucans, are totally inner woven and completely tied to each other inside the cell wall. And that gives a lot of flexibility and strength to the cell wall of fungi. They have to penetrate the soil, they penetrate the wood, they're out there in the environment. So they have to have very tough and flexible cell walls. And it, but it turns out that these cell walls, we recognize those. So when you're eating mushrooms, whether it be a chanterelle or a bolete, our body, and then it starts breaking down, and we'll it's very important to cook them, it's good to cook almost all mushrooms, it's important to cook. Because these polymers are so tough, we cannot digest them. They end up going all the way down, you know, the, our enzymes cannot break them down. Alpha-glucans, yes, like starch, we can break that down easily in our upper gut. For instance, if you eat a bowl of oats, you're getting a lot of alpha-glucans in the form of complex starches, but as soon as you cook those, and eat those, almost all of it, about 70, 80 percent, is absorbed in the upper gut. And so it doesn't get, in, uh, you know, as, as glucose, we need that. We need the energy. It gives us good energy. But the complex fibers don't really make it down in there because they're already broken down during cooking for the most part. However, with mushrooms, when you cook mushrooms and those cell walls start breaking down and we eat those, say a chanterelle, uh, we, the, even the heating process cannot break those down completely. And so we're getting these big pieces of very complex polymers that start getting down in our gut. And first of all, we have these receptor sites in, in our upper gut, uh, Peyer's patches uh, and M, these M cells that can, that can take, and the, our macrophages are circulating around. They basically engulf these, muscle, these mushroom compounds, these complex uh, polymers and take them inside of our body and then this whole amazing cas immune cascade happens that can upregulate many different types of immune functions and downregulate inflammation for instance and um, so th this is a really uh, profound relationship that we have with mushrooms that can profoundly affect our health in that every time we eat any type of mushrooms even yeast so yeasts also contain these beta-glucans and chitins, though they contain a lot less chitin. They're uh, chitin molecules. They're not as tough. And some mushrooms, like, um, for instance, oyster mushrooms, are, um, the chitin levels are lower. So it's very, they're very tender and uh, one of the most digestible of mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, because the cell walls are thinner and more digestible in general. However, if you get some mushrooms like shiitake even, uh, there's quite a bit of beta-glucan and quite a bit of chitin in those. So those need to be cooked, uh, otherwise they could upset your stomach. Uh, maitake is another one that has a lot of beta-glucans and chitin in them. So those need to be cooked. But again, when we eat those, we have this ancient relationship with fungi that's, that really um, upregulates a lot of immune functions and regulates immune functions. For instance, our body's ability to, to produce more T cells and recognize pathogens for many, many decades sometimes, our whole lifetime, after we're exposed to coronavirus, for instance. Uh, a lot of people, you know, in the news, they always talk about um, antibodies, which, yeah, uh, we do spike up antibodies against viruses and other pathogens, but our T cells are much longer, give, give us much longer protection you may have read about that in the news, and they do talk about that. But the T cell recognition to a virus like coronavirus can last for decades. And that's why generally, if you look at the statistics, yes, there have been a lot of infections over the early part of the summer, but 
tradition, but the, the um, serious illness has declined, continued to decline, and maybe a little bit of spiking up for a month there, but, and the deaths have, start, have also been pretty flat or declined. But over time, we've seen that the population is really getting used to coronavirus, and we have this long-term memory. Well, e ingesting mushrooms can actually upregulate our body's ability to produce more T cells and to recognize uh, more pathogens and to hold that recognition for longer. So there, there is some incredible benefit there. The other big benefit, and I'm going to go through some slides here just to, so that I don't just take off on some wild, wild pl place, you know, and just get carried away, um, which is also fun. But um, so um, this, this ancient recognition is really, um, Again, we get that from every mushroom we eat. It doesn't matter cause, because they all have those compounds. Some more than others. For instance, and this is another concept I, I want to um, want to uh, mention, and that is that when you when it get, comes to the um, polypores, the ones that really have a high level of beta glucan and chitin that are very very tough, like these rishis here. I mean, uh, people often say, you know, have asked me. Are, are these edible? And, and turkey tail, I think there's a turkey tail here. Turkey tail is also, when it dries, it's very tough, obviously. So turkey tail has the highest level of beta-glucan of any mushroom. It's up around 55% or even 60% beta-glucan in turkey tail. And turkey tail has more clinical studies than any other mushroom demonstrating that it can upregulate our immune system against cancer, different types of cancer, usually GI cancer. And it can protect people. It can reduce um, uh, immune uh, dysregulation that happens when we're doing chemotherapy, for instance. M many of the clinical trials with turkey tail has, sh has been on one group gets the turkey tail extract, has to be cooked and broken down again, and another group gets chemo uh, plus the, the uh, or sorry, one group gets the chemo and the other group gets chemo plus the turkey tail. So they, they found that, that our immune status is much better after chemo when we're ingesting the mushroom. And, and so again, turkey tail, if you have it nearby, it's a really good one to, to uh, harvest and to cook and to break down, make a powder out of it. I'll, I'm going to mention how to make a powdered extract. Uh, that's really the best way to capture it. So it is edible in the sense that you can take a turkey tail or a reishi, you can put it in a pressure cooker. That's actually the best way to break it down is in a pressure cooker. So if you have a pressure cooker, um, there is, there's a, um, a phenomenon called subcritical ex uh, water extraction. And so when you put, uh, um, for instance, a reishi under pressure and increase the heat, this opens up the molecules and, and so that they, they become a lot more soluble in the water. If you just boil it, you're not, you don't have the pressure there. So yes, you can boil a reishi for hours and, and it will break it down to a certain extent, but you're only getting about 20 or 30% of the active beta-glucans when you boil it. If you put it in a pressure cooker, on the other hand, you've got pressure in there, it turns it in, you get this subcritical water extraction, it opens up the molecules, and they, the molecule bonds loosen up, and it just becomes so much more water soluble, these, these amazing polymers. And, and so if you have a, uh, if you're doing a lot of mushroom extraction, making powders, because the powders are so great, I mentioned that, okay, is this edible? Someone had asked me, is this edible? Well, you're not going to go home and stir fry, you know, w with vegetables and tofu. It just, you know, doesn't work. I've tried it. <laughs> but <coughs> and, but it, if you put it in a pressure cooker and break it down uh, to its basic components, I mean, it's still, there's still going to be some pieces there that you didn't break down, but it's going to be mostly broken down. And then you blend it up till it's creamy, and then you go ahead and put it in a food dehydrator, the fruit leather trays of a food dehydrator, and dehydrate dehydrate that, take the wafer out, and you can use it as chips. You could actually put some seasoning in it there if you wanted to, and you could get turkey tail uh, chips that would be acting as the medicine. So that's one way to do it, but you're better off taking the wafer out, putting it into a coffee grinder, and grinding it up to a powder. The finer the powder, the better. 
So, um, we, and we've done research on this. I work with a couple of mushroom companies. And when we could, the reishi, when you do that to a reishi and, and you grind it up to a powder after the extraction process, the, 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 um, the cell walls and the cells are so um, strong that, that after you dry it, even though the, co the, co the um, particles are down around 150 uh, microns, it's still, you're gonna get these little curled uh, particles. They, they're not round, they're curled. So that's why if you've ever cooked reishi and then ground it up, uh, it's real fluffy. Have you ever seen that before? It's like super fluffy because you have to grind it down to about 50 microns. Then you get round particles and then, and then it's so much more bioavailable then. So that's what I take every day. Uh, I, I, I use, I take matcha, green, green tea matcha, and I put a good helping of that reishi micro powder in there, and that stuff has really kept me healthy. I, I feel the difference. It, I mean, reishi has got so many benefits, which I'll go into a little bit later. But uh, the last thing I wanted to say about um, that process is that I was talking about our microflora and how important it is now and how many, I love the way David talks about, now he, always, he brings in, you know, he's got stories which are really great because that's how we learn. He's got stories, he's got lots of examples, he's got lots of experience, I love that part of it. But he also cites the literature, so I, I really like that, that he's citing the literature and, and uh, to support what he's saying. Remember that, uh, if you ever, you know, our conscience, we have a conscience. Uh, that tells us right from wrong and, and really the, the things to go for and so forth. But do you ever break down the word conscious? Con science means with science. And science doesn't, you know, it have to be a cult. Science is really just looking at the system that you're working with deeply, looking at the system, making hypotheses about how that system works, do, exper you know, do experimentation like David was talking about in the forest. Uh, they're doing science out there, that's, so that, and that's a good thing. There's a lot of anti-science sentiment that you can find out there in, in the population, I think. But science really is something that we can bring to the table that is a process by which we can, we can really increase our chances to get to, harvest, to, to harness this wonderful medicine uh, in a good way and make sure it's safe and effective. But the last thing I wanted to say about that is that um, Recent science has shown that uh, we need complex fibers to, so that our microflora can become more diverse and more complex. And that's what really leads to heightened uh, health, more stable mood, and many other health benefits. And, and there's just tons of research coming out now about that. But uh, it turns out that, you know, what are the best fiber sources out there? I mentioned oats. Oats are fantastic fiber, except for one thing. All oats are, are pre-cooked. So even if you buy oat groats or any type of oat out there and you think, oh, I'm gonna cook it, or if you grind it up to a powder, I'm gonna eat it raw. No, it's not raw, it's already been cooked. Every oat out there on the market has already been pre-cooked. However, you can get raw oat, try to sprout it. If you get oat groats or you know whole oat kernels and you try to sprout it, they won't sprout, they've already been cooked. So that breaks down those complex fibers. And when we eat the oat, we're not getting the full benefit. It isn't drawing as much, isn't regulating our cholesterol and as well, and it also is not feeding the microflora because a lot of it's absorbed in our upper gut. But what they found is, so I, I, get, a raw, I get an oat from an organic farmer uh, that's, that's definitely raw, I've sprouted it and it sprouts, and then grind that up pretty much every day, and then I have some oats, I put water on it, soak it overnight. This is the Swiss way, this is the traditional Swiss way of muesli, of taking the raw oats that you can sprout, putting fruit and nuts in there, soaking it overnight, it becomes really creamy, and then you eat that in the morning. And so that's a very traditional health, health way of, of you know, having a breakfast. And, uh, and that, that way you're gonna get the maximum amount of fiber down in your microflora. But the two other foods that are the highest in fiber that really feed the, and increase the diversity of our microflora is number one, beans and legumes. Legumes are a fantastic source of complex fibers and probably among the highest types of food. Many traditional cultures that live long, healthy lives, like in Greece and other places, 
blue zones have a high legume diet. That's, that's one of the main things that they're eating. And, um, and so guess what the top type of fiber is that is, that is you know, not only highest in fiber, some, some of the individual ones, well, you don't have to guess, you know what I'm coming to, uh, turkey tail is like 50 to 60 percent soluble and insoluble fiber, but it's very complex and it does not get digested in the upper gut. It goes down, some of it gets, does get digested, obviously the terpenes, the phenolics, the vitamins and the minerals, if we break it down and cook it well, grind it up, make a powder, put that in our food, put a tablespoon of uh, turkey tail um, powder, this powdered tea, I tell how to do that stuff, I stuff in my throat. So making these powders, this is very traditional in China and other places. That's how they, they capture the medicine and the nutrition. Remember the turkey tail also has vitamins, minerals, it's loaded with minerals. Turkey tail has lots of minerals, has protein, the whole range of, of nutrition is in the turkey tail and the reishi. fibers that are resistant to cooking and so forth do get down and they feed our microflora. So there has been a couple of recent studies that show that mushroom fiber, eating mushrooms, can really increase the complexity and diversity of our microflora and regulate our mood. The first study I've ever seen showing that, that eating mushrooms can regulate our mood based on this, this mechanism that I'm talking about now. So, let's see, can you change the slide? Down arrow. Down arrow, yeah. My book is available. Next slide. Uh, kingdom fungi, uh, fungi used to be lumped in with the plants. Do you remember that back, you know, if you're old enough to remember, you know, that, w that we used to put, say that, that fungi were, were part of kingdom, uh, the plant kingdom which obviously isn't true, there's so, so many differences. But it turns out doing the genetics, uh, turns out doing the genetics uh, fungi are more, ha share more common ancestors with animals than they do with plants. So, and there, there's, you know, there's some interesting things about that. Uh, so here are five fantastic fungal facts. One is that they've been around for a long, long time. We've been interacting with them for over a billion years. Animals have been interacting with them for over a billion years. So that's pretty remarkable. Um, again, uh, they, uh, on the other thing is that, do you know about endophytes? Endophytes are fun fungi, single cell fungi, or, you know, and, or sometimes they produce mycelial in, mycelium in the leaves of all plants, pretty much all plants, pines, conifers, uh, any type of plant you might imagine has a, a, a microbiota uh, actually inside. Not only we know that fungi interact with the, with the you know, the roots, and that this is a complex system. Uh, if you, and if you haven't read *Entangled Life* by Merlin Sheldrake, that's a great read that really discusses that. Um, but we know that. But but you know we don't think so much about that inside the plant, there's also a complex microflora. There's, there's also a complex microbiota, which is interacting with the chemistry of the leaves and the chemistry of the plant and, and helping with nutrition, protecting the leaves against uh, bacterial invasion, uh, for instance. Uh, and it turns out that, that uh, and I, we don't have time to explore this, but what's really interesting is that some medicinal plants, like yew is a good example, and the taxol in you. At first, uh, they discovered uh, taxol, which is this complex compound that has a super strong anti-cancer effect. I don't know if you remember this, but, but anyway, taxol is still used as an anti-cancer drug, as a chemotherapeutic drug. And um, so they started strip mining the forest, and, and it's in these old um, you know, yew trees. They started really cutting these old yew trees and extracting the taxol until they found that it was actually the, the endophytes in the leaves that were producing the taxol. So then they could start culturing uh, the, those, um, those organisms and um, you know, it, they produced the taxol. So they didn't have to cut the yew tree, they could actually culture it and, 
and get the taxol. So my point being is that many medicinal plants, the, the secondary compounds, the active compounds, might actually be coming from fungi that are growing inside the plant. So that's another fact that you usually we don't talk about or no, know too much about, but I think there's certainly a lot more. Uh, and mushrooms profoundly activate ancient and modern immune pathways, and I mentioned that already. And they're so essential for recycling, obviously, dead wood and, and other things. And it's the, they're the highest source of, micro, of uh, dietary fiber. Next slide. Um, they're very popular around the world as medicines. So in, in uh, Asia, for instance, uh, there are, well, you know, one of, one of my um, in, uh, things that I like to talk about, think about, is that in many cultures, David talks a lot about this, like in China, certainly, when I went over, after I got my acupuncture license, I went over to Hangzhou and I lived in China for a while, and what I and I went into this small little restaurant. I was working in a traditional hospital, and I would go next door on lunchtime to get some food, some soup or you know stir fries or whatever. And uh, I noticed that that every meal had mushrooms in it. And so th they, I noticed that, I, and I when I talked to people there that were working in the hospital, I was working with a couple of acupuncturists and a couple of herbalists that were Chinese. And, and they said, yes, we eat mushrooms almost every day. And I went to the marketplace and I saw all these different types of mushrooms. And I just love the wood ear so much that, you know, they're kind of, have you ever had those? They're kind of crunchy a little bit. And they're, they're, I don't know, they, I just, I, I, my soup wasn't the same unless it had a lot of wood ear in it. So I, I had to, you know, I tried to get them, I tried to, um, I had a Chinese tutor. So I was trying to learn to say, could you please add more wood ear to my soup? And, but, I, but you know, they just look at me blankly. I'd practice and practice because of the tones. I never could get the tones right. So finally, my teacher wrote out in Chinese, please add more, more um, wood ear. And so I just showed it to them and they go, okay. And then <laughs> they load up the wood ear in the soup. But, but my point being is that some cultures are, using my, are eating mushrooms and incorporating them into our, in their diet as a major portion of their diet are certainly a, a considerable amount of, of their diet. And now, you know, in our country, David's making this point, is that, uh, you know, it, it's just, and, and it's really amazing to see the rise of so many growers and, and cultivators and companies selling mushroom products, and they're so much more available, and you can go to the store and you can find, well, in Santa Cruz, I can go to the store and I can find, <coughs> you know, uh, maitake and, and e even, even lion's mane and, and two or three, four, even wood ear. And, uh, but you know, if you go into a lot of places in the country, you still can only find button mushrooms. They don't even have shiitake. So it's, we still have a long way to go, obviously, to, to get into the same area as a culture, um, a, a fungophilic culture that really loves mushroom and has a long history with mushrooms. But my point being, it's a major part of their diet. And they're not only, in China, they're not only eating it for, because it's pleasurable, because it's delicious, because it adds a lot of, of crunchiness or texture to their, to their diet and their cuisine, like shiitake is in almost everything, obviously. Uh, if you go to Chinatown in San Francisco, so many dishes have mushrooms in, in them. Um, but, it, but they're also eating it for the health-promoting benefits. And I have a book called the fungi pharmacopoeia, and it was translated from the Chinese. And they, they have, you know, I don't know how many exactly, but it's over a hundred species that are known to be used as food slash medicine in China. And there was an English copy, it's no longer in print. But that's, that's one of the impetuses that really got me going on medicinal qualities and the health qualities of mushrooms. So, so that's what I like to talk about, and I've got some slides here, but uh, more specifics about the nutrition, the nutritional qualities of mushrooms. So next slide. Um, so very little fat, no cholesterol. There, is, there are fatty acids in mushrooms that are beneficial. It's not, they're not high fat types of foods, but there are, they do have some good fatty acids in them. 
the mineral content is very high in mushrooms. So when you're eating whatever it's a porcini or chanterelle or whatever it might be, they are really loaded with trace minerals. So there's a lot of iron, surprisingly, copper, zinc. Uh, so they're, they're all the trace minerals, they're very, very good sources of trace minerals, which oftentimes we don't get. If we're buying produce that has been commercially produced and, it, and, and uh, you know, they pump a lot of nitrogen on it, whether it be chard or whether it be any type of vegetable, root vegetables even, the, the plant is growing so fast. And, and of course, they, the producers, especially corporate farms, want, want to turn, turn that crop around quickly uh, and make a higher profit. But there isn't the time for the roots to go down in the soil <coughs> and break down um, you know, using different enzymes and absorbing those minerals. That takes longer, like iron and copper and zinc from the soil. And so oftentimes, I believe, and I've seen studies on this, where the typical vegetable that you would get out of the market is really not very uh, rich in some of these trace minerals. Not as rich as you would hope or expect. Even things like kale. But mushrooms, on the other hand, are take, you know, they have special ways of getting those, those um, minerals up and, and, and take those up from the soil. So they are a fantastic source of trace minerals which are so important to our health. B vitamins, there, there are a lot of B vitamins in mushrooms. Uh, there's a good big complement of B vitamins in our mushrooms. Um, a bit, they have a higher content of B vitamins than any common food except meat, perhaps. So they are very high in B. It's a great slimming food, obviously. Cholesterol regulation. If we're eating mushrooms often, <coughs> it's really if, if you know someone or if we're having problems with cholesterol and, uh, and beginning cardiovascular disease, I mean, so many, it's still the leading cause of death, cardiovascular disease. And they've done dissection on teenagers and young people who have died in car accidents, and they found atherosclerotic changes in the vessels, even in our teenage years. So we all have some degree of atherosclerotic lesions and deposits, fatty deposits in our vessels. But I would argue that mushrooms are really one of the very best ways to slow that process, to reverse that process, because not only of the incredibly high fiber content, uh, that's really important uh, for cholesterol regulation, but also, uh, for instance, shiitake has some, some specific compounds that we know can help lower cholesterol and regulate our cholesterol. Um, and again, high in fiber. Next slide, please. Um, and the protein, the, the amount of protein in mushrooms is just so phenomenal. When I first started looking at the nutritional aspects of mushrooms years ago, I was really blown away to find out that, that mushrooms, some mushrooms really uh, rival uh, animal products and meat as, as for the amount of protein, but also the bioavailability and the completeness of the protein. You probably know that that some of the amino acids that make up the proteins in our diet, we have to have those because our body can't synthesize those. Those are essential. Uh, so, amino acids. And it turns out that mushrooms contain a full complement of amino acids, and they're very bioavailable. Uh, bioavailable and the, so, the accessibility of, of the protein is very, very high in mushrooms. And some mushrooms, like different species of pleurotus, can have up to 25 or even 30 percent usable protein. So you can imagine uh, why other cultures harvest them and grow them. And, and not only that, but they're so much more efficient to grow. than Like if you're grazing cows out in the pasture and you're getting the meat products and the dairy products from the animals, how much land they use, how much re water and how much resources they take to get a certain amount of protein you can get tw up to 25 times more protein for the same amount of resources if you're growing mushrooms on, you know, even bio waste, even just cutting trees and clearing shrub and so forth. So uh, you can see why it's so popular around the world to eat and so necessary in their diet to eat mushrooms uh, because they, they are such a complete food. And, in many ways, and but protein, uh, you know, I was really surprised to see how how great, how high quality the protein is 
in mushrooms. So my point being is that considering all of the whole nutritional package that you're getting with mushrooms and fungi and eating them regularly, it's a fantastic way to transition from a mostly animal-based diet to a whole foods plant-based diet. And one of the best the health books I ever read was the China study, where there's a new edition of it out now. And he's got decades of research showing that many chronic illnesses, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and many others, chronic liver disease, are, are really um, going to be a whole lot less, like half or even more, less than half, if you are eating mostly a plant -based, whole foods plant-based diet versus a, highly, a high meat diet. You know, many people in our country are having animal products daily at every meal, right? I mean, I know there's a lot of being, lot of being, there's a lot being written about um, a plant-based diet, the importance of a plant-based diet for longevity. Uh, that's true, there is a lot being written about that now, but that's because there's so much more emerging research. The, the most recent dietary research shows that the, probably the healthiest diet that we can have uh, is a high carb, complex carbohydrate diet, moderate protein, moderate fat. Uh, and that is that people live longer and have less chronic illnesses when we have a high complex carbohydrate diet and having s and moderate protein, moderate fat. And having said that, obviously anytime you refine the carbohydrate, that changes the whole story. Then that is not true. So that's, you know, unfortunately if you go into the stores, that's a great deal of what we're eating as far as carbohydrates go. So m bottom line is that, you know, I'm just trying to um, really point out how powerful mushrooms are in, in our diet, not only for just the wonder of getting out in the forest and collecting them, and, and as David points out so much, the, the association of others, the community that we create, the mushroom-loving community <coughs> together is so great. And so I'm just so happy to be here with everybody and, and enjoy our community while we're here. Uh, and that is so important. That's such a big part of our health is sharing things like that with others. That, uh, and so I'm really appreciated appreciating this conference and being here. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so the, the medicine that we can, let's go on to more specific, the actual phenolics and the medicine that we can extract from mushrooms, and they certainly do have a lot. And they've been, like Rishi, <coughs> you can read the Pan Sao, you can read some of these old Chinese herb books, because mushrooms, some of the mushrooms are considered herbs in Chinese medicine and other, other uh, traditional cultures, especially Chinese medicine. And if you look back on some of the, of the ancient texts, the ancient medicine or herb books, there are mushrooms that are included in there, such as reishi, of course. <coughs> Wood ear uh, and other species are mentioned as medicine in the very, very ancient books going back 2,000 years ago. And in the Western herbal tradition, uh, we have Dioscorides, which was the most famous ancient herbalist of all time. Dioscorides was the um, was the physician to Nero's army, and he traveled all over the known world um, when Nero's forces were out there, whatever they were doing, conquering and, and whatever. And uh, he saw, you know, he, he treated people with herbal medicine. And his, when, and then when he came back, he wrote it all down in Dioscorides De Materia Medica, which is the most famous herbal of all time, published in about the first century common era, uh, that's, that's, you know, 900, over nine, uh, 1900 years ago. So, so this is a very ancient book. And it was still one of the main medicine books in, in, all, in many different cultures up until about the 1700s. So this was a very influential book. Uh, they mentioned about five or six different mushrooms in that book that were used in ancient times. People were very fearful of mushrooms in those days. Because, and they only used a very few because, uh, you know, using phylloides or, or other lethal mushrooms was a, was a very um, efficient way and covert way of, of poisoning their rivals. So did you ever watch I, Claudius, that, that series that was on PBS? Uh, you know, the, uh, just about every episode they were talking about doing away with their nephew who was going to 
going to um, ascend to the throne and so forth. So, so that, because they're, they're tasteless, they don't have any taste and, and, and they're absolutely lethal. And it was not only that, but it was a very, not a pleasant way to go either. Yeah, so, so this, you know, that's, I think that's probably why they didn't have too many mushrooms that were mentioned in, in ancient Greece because of that. But, but they did use a few, like wood ear was, was well known to them and some others. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to skip through some of these uh, and just mention, uh, just kind of summarize it. All mushrooms have beta-glucans, 1, 3, 1, 6, D-beta-glucans. These are the polymers that are mainly found in, in all mushroom cell walls and that we've really worked out world in labs around the world how they affect our immune system. And it's profound. It really, we do get a full, wide-ranging upregulation of a lot of aspects of our immune system against pathogens, for instance, or cancer cells or disease cells, whatever. Um, it, and, and we know exactly what receptor sites are active, like toll-like -right, toll receptors, dectin. So we've really worked out the mechanisms. Next slide, please. Uh, there, this is kind of a cross-section of, um, of the cell wall here. Glycoproteins on the outside. These the fungus use uh, to kind of sense their, their environment and to interact with other types of organisms. So these glycoproteins are basically they're, they're sensors for the environment. And then you get manoproteins to kind of give a softness, I guess, to the outer portion of the cell wall. This is just this cross-section of the cell wall. Then inside here is the cytoplasm, which contains all the organelles like the nucleus and mitochondria and so forth. Um, and terpenes and, and phenolics are the other main compounds that are inside the cell wall. But all the, the immunomodulating compounds are found in the cell wall. So here's the beta-glucans, again, they're, they're highly branched. Uh, here's the chitin here, uh, another glycoprotein. And, and these are intimately inter interacting here, interconnected. Uh, that's why these, the, the beta-glucans, the active compounds, are not well absorbed. If you take a reishi like this and cut it up and boil it for two or three hours and then drink the tea, you're only going to be getting around 15 to 20 percent of the beta-glucans, of the immunomodulating compounds. 15 to 20 percent, because they're just not water-soluble. However, if you, you know, if you put them in a pressure cooker and break it down, blend it up, put it in a food dehydrator, get a fruit leather mushroom, uh, mushroom leather uh, wafer, grind it up to a fine powder. You can get grinders that will grind it down to 150 microns. That's a pretty fine powder. And then store that in jars. You can put that in your food. You can put it in soups. You can sprinkle it into stir fries. And turkey tail actually has a really nice mushroomy flavor, believe it or not. And again, you're getting the nutrition and the immunomodulating compounds. So uh, if you've got a big source of turkey tail, like in Santa Cruz a couple years ago, we found like 10 logs that were just covered with turkey tails from one end to the other. Thousands of fruiting bodies. And, and you know, I didn't, I didn't take them all, but I took a good, good number of fruiting bodies and, uh, and, you know, went through the process, made a powder, and then, and then it really has a nice flavor. It really reminds me of my mother's cream of mushroom soup. And so I enjoy eating it, kind of brings me back. But also, I know all the incredible benefits I'm getting by adding a teaspoon of the mushroom powder, reishi, or turkey tail, or, or others, into my cu cuisine. It adds a flavor. Uh, it adds all of this incredible medicine in there, too. Um, so, anyway, the, that's the cell wall. Next slide, please. Here's, a, here's the uh, space. It's a very complex molecule, as you can see here. Next slide. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into all, but it does, it does, here's one here, it, it upregulates cells like monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, which are really immune regulating cells. In, the, in our body, natural killer cells to go after pathogens, neutrophils to engulf pathogens, T cells, and B cells. And T memory cells are long-term memory of pathogens. B cells produce antibodies. So all of this is gonna get upregulated to a large extent. And if you're using the powders regularly, that is an, that is an or eating mushrooms regularly, 
you, you can see why many traditional cultures, I know I've said this before, but many traditional cultures have gravitated towards mushrooms as a major part of their cuisine, not only because of their flavor th and, and that they just enjoy them, but because I, I would argue it's because they noticed that people were healthy, healthier when they ate them, that they lived longer when they ate them, and they were providing incredible nutrition. And, and it's very difficult to get meat and animal products. It takes a lot more resources in many cultures to get a lot of, you know, to, to grow animals or, um, you know, graze animals or whatever. Um, okay, next slide. So there are all these different effects. By the way, this slideshow is up on YouTube. Uh, you can watch it and, and uh, you can kind of fast forward the slides to what you're interested in. So this, you know, you could use this as a study guide. I have a lot of sub um, kind of condensed information in here, how they work on our immune system specifically. I'm not going to go into all those details today because I definitely see more eyes like drooping and closing in the back there but it is yeah, I find it fascinating personally but but you know I'm a geek so so you can't <coughs> well, admittedly so um, so you know you can get into okay here's here's the beta glucans what happens when when we when it binds to you know our macrophage kind of engulf some of these particles what happens all the different mechanisms inside well I can just tell you a lot happens it's very complex it's very fascinating <laughs> but I'm not going to go in, but I do go into more detail in my book but and and I have articles on you know on on this on my website christopherhobbs.com um, you can follow me on Instagram I'm doing a bunch of reels every day every day or every other day uh, on herbs and on mushrooms <laughs> yeah, if you have specific questions, feel free. I'll b I'm here, so I'll be out in the woods, hopefully. Next slide. <coughs> so here's more of the same. But it does affect both of our innate immune system, our Im the immediate response we have to pathogens, and it also affects our adaptive immune response, our long-term. Uh, and, and so by, in by using these, by eating these, ingesting these frequently, you know, our whole immune system is more um, alert, and in the, in the time, I mean, I, I work with several mushroom companies that produce mushroom powders and so forth, and they have seen their sales double in the last couple of years, or more, and these were companies that already were doing a lot of business, but they can't keep up with the demand, and I would argue it's because of the pandemic a lot. A lot of us want to keep our immune system vigilant and strong, uh, and uh, you know, it's very reasonable. Uh, next slide. Um, so here's the beta-glucan content of wild fungi. Again, uh, the beta-glucans are not the only active medicinal compounds in mushrooms, but they certainly have been the best studied, and they, they are very, very important. So if you buy a mushroom product, and uh, this, is a, this is another story altogether, but if you're out there in the marketplace and you buy a bottle of capsules off the shelf of, say, Rishi or Lion's Mane, uh, you don't forget that, and I'm not going to go into great detail on this. You can ask me questions later if you have them. But <coughs> you're likely to get a very high percentage of starch out of those products. Why? Because many manufacturers will cultivate the mushroom on a grain substrate like brown rice and which is okay because you, you know, and this question has been going around our, our industry for a while now. Is it bad to cultivate them on rice? No, it's not bad to cultivate them on rice. You can grow, you can grow reishi fruiting bodies on rice, believe it or not. I've got pictures of it. I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, they don't look quite the same as this. They're not perfect, but, but you can produce fruiting bodies that have a pretty high beta-glucan content on rice only. Uh, but the whole question is, is that the manufacturer is only letting the mycelium grow for, say, a month. So the, the mushroom hasn't had time to go out and consume all of the starch and all of the nutrients there. And, and, but if it does, it, there's such a surplus. Of, it's like, to mushrooms, it's like junk food in a way. It's like snack food because th those compounds, th that, those energy compounds, the starch is so bioavailable it's going to start 
you know, if, if, it, if there's, the, the manufacturer doesn't let it grow for two or three months so that the mushroom can consume all the substrate, you're still going to get a lot of starch in that product. But not, even if it does consume a lot of it, some of it is going to be stored as glycogen. So, so mushrooms will actually store excess glucose as glycogen, kind of like animals do. We store, if we have a surplus of of, of uh, glucose as energy, we store our liver stores it as glycogen, so you can quickly get that energy when we need it. And mushrooms, when they fruit, need a lot of energy, so that's where they, that's why they store the glycogen, and just like animals do. And then when they're going to go, when they're going to fruit, then they have access to all this energy. So my point being is that wood growing species like reishi and turkey tail, you're growing those on rice, it's going to be higher in starch than if you're, it's growing just on wood. That's true. But you can grow mushrooms on brown rice and still get reasonable quality, and it's a lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. But you can add, for wood, growing, wood um, loving species, you can, can add some sawdust or, or wood in there too. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of that. But, but again, beta-glucans are so important, and we're just now starting to see in the marketplace where some companies are starting to guarantee the amount of beta-glucan in their product. So I only know of two companies right now that are doing that, but, but we, it is starting, it is beginning. I actually have a lab behind my house, and I do beta-glucan testing. So I just finished an analysis. So I've, done, I've tested a lot of commercial products, and many of them have very low amounts of beta-glucan. And to me, that's going to mean probably it's low amounts of phenolics and terpenes as well. So um, probably, uh, so again, if they, are, they have to be cultivated properly. It has to be an aggressive strain that's going to eat up all that substrate. And then they have, to allow, they have to be allowed to grow long enough. Usually takes up to three months to really get all that substrate um, digested and turned into mushroom mycelium. Uh, so, so that's really the story there. And also, they'll start to fruit after, say, two months or three months. They're starting to fruit. Even on blocks, though, they will definitely produce fruit, fruiting bodies. So here are some of the wild mushrooms and, and cultivated mushrooms. Don't, don't forget that it, the fruiting body itself contains zero starch. There's no starch in the fruiting body. Mushrooms do not produce starch, except a little tiny bit in the spores. So... Um, so wild mushrooms, that's the beauty of it. Chanterelles up to 27% beta-glucan in the stalk and say 24% in the, the, the cap. Uh, honey mushroom is loaded with beta-glucans. They're almost 39%, 33% in the cap. Porcini, look at that, s almost 58% in the stalk. So do not throw the stalk away of a porcini. That is probably the, one of the highest of all mushrooms in beta-glucans. So those are incredibly um, medicinal, you might say. So it's always good for, I, I always like it, to, you know, eating them. I love porcini, I love to eat them. But I'm also thinking, man, I'm getting all these beta-glucans. My immune system is getting, get, really getting vigilant here and I don't have to worry about COVID because I'm eating porcini every day. <laughs> and I'm happy too. So. That's got to that's got to mean something. Um, so turkey tail up to 61 percent beta glucan. Maitake isn't as much 26. Wood ear 20 23. Reishi up to 54 um, percent fiber that's going to lead to complexity of your microflora and also really kick your immune system up into high gear. Button mushroom. That's one reason why I don't eat button mushroom. Button mushroom, 12% beta-glucan. Um, shiitake, 25. Oyster, 24. So chanterelle, 27. So, so wild mushrooms have a, have, tend to have a lot of beta-glucans in them. That's my point. Next slide. <coughs> in commercial products, here there, they, um, some scientists pulled some products off the shelf and tested them for beta. There's only one, one um, kind of, I don't say improved, but, but validated test for, for detecting the amount of beta-glucan in a, in a product or a mushroom. <coughs> and that's the metazyme, that's the metazyme test, which is available in this country. Um, 
So they, they collected some cordyceps products, they collected some reishi products, um, 16 blend, you'll, you'll get these mushroom blends out there in the marketplace, seven blends, chaga, and this is what they found. Uh, I think it, this is a few years ago, I think it's hopefully a little better now, but they found that the cordyceps products had between one and a half and about 11% beta-glucan, reishi, look at that, four to seven percent. That's because it, there's just so much starch in there. That's what that means. Reishi, um, here's, another, here's another one where, the, where this is fruiting body only. So if you extract the fruiting body only, yes, you're going to get 45 percent beta-glucan, up, up to 45 percent. 16 bland low, 7, um, seven bland low, and chaga zero. So um, there's a wide range of quality in the mushroom products on the mar in the marketplace. That's why I always recommend harvest your own, make your own if you can. Again, turkey tail is one of the most active. Reishi, uh, I pick, you know, if you go on the east coast, if you're, uh, I don't know if Ganoderma grows up here in Aplanatum, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's fine. That has tons of beta-glucan in it. But uh, in California, we have a couple of different species and and uh, I, lo I love going up to the ant wild old hemlock forest in the, up in the high Sierra, and you can find these giant reishi-like like fruiting bodies, and, and that's fun to make medicine with. In the East Coast and in the Midwest, there are a number of species that I call reishi-like mushrooms because they're, they're Ganoderma with annual fruiting bodies that, cam that the chemistry is you know, probably very similar between species. Uh, another, uh, next slide, please. Um, so some possible indications, each species has, has some indications that they, where there are clinical trials or there are in vivo and in, in, vivo, in vivo and in vitro studies. Uh, so, and some are by tradition. For instance, cordyceps uh, is a cultural treasure in Asia. And <coughs> you may know that it's a, it's a, I've got slides later, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a caterpillar that lives in the soil for three years and then uh, the weaker ones are infected by different fungal sp spores and the, the, um, the mycelium starts di uh, growing inside the caterpillar. It changes its brain chemistry so the caterpillar comes up to the, to the surface and then uh, it fru it, the fruiting body comes up above the surface and then the spores go out from there. Uh, so, uh, so cordyceps, cordyceps or but now it's Ophiocordyceps sinensis, is a cultural treasure. And like for instance, if you are a businessman and you're, you're giving somebody a present, one of your co colleagues, you might give them a package with a, a ribbon on it and they open it up and inside of these, these caterpillars with, with you know, mushroom fruiting bodies coming out of their head and, and they get all excited. <laughs> so, I mean, what would it be like in this, I always fantasize, what would it be like if you gave you know, one, one of your family members some cordyceps and they open it up and, you know, <laughs> what's this? <laughs> so, so anyway, this, this is a cultural treasure. It's been used and written about for probably a couple thousand years for increasing performance, not only sexual performance, but, but sports performance, vitality, uh, and, and also for, for counteracting fatigue. And as ad an adaptogen to help counteract stress or keep us keep stress from affecting us adversely. However, when you look at the clinical trials, when you look at the science, there's really not much. There really is not much. So, um, and and not only that, but but uh, doing the genetic work, I'm trained in in genetic analysis, phylogenetics, and uh, I did. I got a lot of cordyceps products from from all over the place, online, from India, China. This is a big project I did with a, with a chemical lab down in, in, in the southern states, Mississippi. And, and I, you know, I, I used next-gen sequencing and, and Sanger sequencing, and what I found was that almost, you, you cannot find in general, you know, ordinary products unless they are from China and you actually buy the worm or, or the caterpillar and the fruiting body, then you're going to get Ophiocordyceps sinensis. But otherwise, no, none of them were Ophiocordyceps sinensis. They were all 
Other species, like Tulipocladium inflatum, was very common, uh, or it was um, Cordyceps militaris. So what I came down to is that, uh, I'm kind of focusing on Cordyceps here, but, but uh, what I came down to is that there is a lot of substitution and adulteration in the marketplace, and especially for Cordyceps, but for other, maybe other species, uh, like Ganoderma, you don't exactly know what species you're getting, uh, usually there are no guarantees, except I've done, I've tested some of the products out there, and typically in this country, people are cultivating Ganoderma lingzhur, which we think is the ancient rishi, and so that's good. I, I've, I've tested maybe 10 different products, and they've all been pretty much Ganoderma lingzhur or Ganoderma sichuanense. So these are the two ones that are in trade out of China, typically. Um, but Cordyceps is, you know, kind of all over the place. And if you buy a Cordyceps product, make sure if it says Cordyceps sinensis on it, or if it says just Cordyceps, look at the ingredients panel and see what species they're, they're advertising. Because if they put, opio, they put Cordyceps sinensis, they're not only behind the time in their taxonomy, but they're also not being truthful because it's not Cordyceps sinensis in there, or opiocordyceps. It's probably either Cordyceps militaris, if it's been cultivated in this country, or maybe some other species, like Bacillomyces. There's, um, there's another famous one, Bacillomyces, is the genus uh, that's called Cordymax. It's sold under the name Cordymax, or CS4. Uh, that's another genus altogether. But it, that does have some clinical trials on it showing that it protects the kidneys. So that's the other thing with cordyceps is that if somebody, uh, I have a patient right now that has, has um, mild kidney failure because they ha they're dealing with hypertension. If you have hypertension for a long time, that's gonna really injure the kidneys. And they're taking a lot of cordyceps militaris every day. And, the, and we are seeing better kidney function. And this is after about six months of really imbibing cordyceps militaris. So again, if it says cordyceps sinensis on it, or if it says just cordyceps, make sure to look and see what uh, species they're advertising. This is just an example of what you can find out there in the marketplace. Lion's mane, I don't, I don't expect that's gonna be adulterated. Uh, though there are other species um, of heresium that, that can be used that have similar chemistry, but they're not as meaty and thick as uh, Arenaceus. Um, so shiitake is often used for preventing infections, again, to boost your immune, immunity. Shiitake and turkey tail has a lot of clinical research, human clinical trials for cancer. Um, reishi and turkey tail as antivirals, uh, reishi for, and reishi has some special properties based on its traditional use in Chinese medicine, and that is reishi has been called a spirit mushroom. And, or it calms the spirit. And when you read the old, older texts, I talk about this in my book, when you read some of the older books, people would go up in the high mountains to pick rishi. They'd go on a kind of a vision quest and they'd go up high in the mountains. They'd pick a rishi brooding body if they found it. And uh, if you get a fresh one, they can be really tender. The, the leading edge is very, very tender and you can eat that. And, and so what they mention, even in the Pan Sao, the most famous medicine book, is that the ancients would go up there and they said you had to have your mind had to be right and your spirit had to be in the right place, otherwise Rishi will not show itself. So you can't find Rishi unless you're in a good way. So they'd recommend fasting and maybe meditating or whatever for a few days before going and looking for Rishi. I kind of like that spirit as aspect of it. So I think of Rishi as a spirit mushroom too, definitely. And so they'd say you, when you eat the fresh mushroom uh, up in the high mountains, that you, you, this, that will lead to longevity. That will increase your lifespan. And it'll, even if you eat enough of it, that you will be like the immortals. So they actually said that based on texts, you know, way back when. I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but, you know, I take it every day, so we'll see what happens. But, you know, it's all an experiment. But anyway, so these are some of the ones. Can, so just um, maybe go, let's go. Um, more than 270 recognized species of mushrooms are known to have immunotherapeutic properties. Fifty non-toxic mushroom species have been studied 
in human studies or in in vivo and in vitro studies, six species have been studied in human cancers in clinical trials. So there, there is a lot, there's a tremendous body of research on the medicinal pr uh, properties of mushrooms. And here's the reference down here. Next slide. Um, so this is just, I basically already said, said this. Next slide. Uh, na next slide. Um, yeah, and, and again, even, even Rishi, uh, when I was in China, they said, yeah, we, you know, we cut up Rishi and we put it and we boil it and then we go ahead and put our meat in there, like chicken or something and vegetables, uh, whatever food we're going to put in the soup. So, they, you know, they know about cutting up Rishi and, and that's probably a long, long history of doing that. And they're not going to eat the Rishi. You can't, I don't care if you pound it, boil it and pound it and boil it and pound it, it's still not going to get tenderized. So, so they put, just put that aside, but, but it's got the medicine in there. Same with like astragalus, wang chi, uh, which is a big immune booster herb. They, would, they put the sticks right in the soup and boil it and then get the essence out, and then they just push that aside and go ahead and eat the soup and the chicken or whatever. Next slide. <coughs> in ch there's no Chinese medicine. Wolfaporia cocos is, a, is one of the ma leading ones that are used. Zhu Ling for removing excess water in the body and boosting the immunity. Ling Zhu, again, for uh, disturbed Shan. And Shan is the spirit, basically. It's, uh, it's, if you think about soul, you know, the, I've just recently been studying um, you know, the, the psyche a lot. Freud's um, conception of the psyche. So the, suppose, according to him and, and also Jung, his student, the psyche is, you know, our manufactured self that, that includes, or perhaps some, um, some parts of ourself uh, that were there, are, are always there. Um, so com composed of two parts, uh, our mind, wh which does, in, in, you know, our memory and our ability to project into the future in the past, so to time travel. You know, we have the ability to time travel because we're thinking about the future, we're thinking about the past, uh, what if, so that's part of our mind. And then there's the soul. And our soul is, you know, supposedly arises from our, our spiritual nature, but then also has more components, and there's an interaction between our mind and our environment and so forth, and, and the, the spiritual um, essence that we have. And so Lingzhir is supposedly, if we have disturbed Shen, that, that's really part of our soul, our shen, our spirit. Uh, and so if you feel really agitated, you're having disturbed dreaming, nightmares, uh, so you, have, you have a lot of trauma in your life, then they say, then they prescribe rishi. They, they prescribe rishi and you take that every day, about um, six, four to six grams of the extract powder, four to six grams daily. Now one thing I wanted to mention before I forget, don't forget that these beta-glucans and the, the chitin, the, the cell wall polymers that modulate our, <coughs> our, our immune system, reduce inflammation in our body if there's excess inflammation, they are not soluble in alcohol. They have zero solubility in alcohol. So therefore, you know, people do make tinctures of reishi or tinctures of turkey tail maybe. Okay, you can get the phenolics out, which have antioxidant properties. These are smaller molecules. You can also get the terpenes out. That have, they, they have like neurological properties and all kinds of other interesting bio effects. But you're not gonna get this strong immunomodulating effect from a tincture. A double extraction is, is obviously a compromise. You're, you're boiling down the herbs, you're grinding them, boiling them down. I would prefer a pressure cooker. Then you're taking that, you're pressing out the mark uh, or, or uh, no, you're pressing out the mark and then tincturing the mark in alcohol. And then you're pulling out all these small molecular weight compounds, press that out, and then you're blending the two uh, liquids together. And, and then as long as you have 25% alcohol in that finished product, that will preserve it indefinitely from fermenting or molding or whatever. So that's a double extraction. I talk about how to do that in my book. Uh, so that's, that's pretty popular, and I think that's a good compromise if you want a the convenience of a liquid, for instance. Next slide. Um, okay, most clinically relevant. We're, we've kind of mentioned those. Uh, next slide. 
uh, turkey tail is, um, you know, it's, it's ubiquitous. I've seen it everywhere I've been, for sure. So it is pretty ubiquitous. And it's the, mu it's the number one studied mushroom for immunomodulation and uh, for use in a cancer treatment program uh, based on Chinese research and Japanese clinical trials. So there are many clinical trials that you can access. Uh, and, and they've made a couple of drugs out of them, uh, PSK and PSP. If you, go, if you want to look up some of this research, just go on Google Scholar or, or, um, or PubMed.gov. Those are the two major databases for searching the scientific literature. And uh, PubMed is the world's largest medical database. It's free for searching. And our tax dollars pay for it. So you go on to PubMed, type in PSK, or you know, and, or PSP. PSK has more research, and and PSK is basically just a concentrated extract of turkey tail mycelium. That's all it is in a liquid culture. So they're not growing it on grain. It has no starch in it. It's a liquid culture. They spin all the liquid off, take that pure mycelium, and they extract it, uh, and get all. And so it's got very high beta glucan content. And that's where almost all the clinical trials were performed with, with PSK, which is just a crude extract of turkey tail, pure mycelium. So we can make it at home, basically. But if you type in that in PubMed, you'll get the research. And you can either read the abstracts, or in many cases, you can get the full text article. Next slide. Um, they're beautiful. They're very photogenic, I, th I think. It's called burst of color because you know, they, they come in all colors. I've seen, I've seen different colored ones. They're blue ones, and of course, it might be different species, but next slide. Sterium is the false turkey tail, so-called false turkey tail. It has the beta-glucans. It ha it's non-toxic. It grows a lot, oftentimes around true, the true turkey tail, um, uh, uh, Stramides versicolor. Um, but, but I don't use it because it doesn't have the long history of use that turkey tail has. Next slide. Next slide. Here's um, the, I remember that the Trimedes versicolor has a snow white pore surface. They look very similar. This is the underside of the sterium. So you can see it's kind of an orange buffy uh, pore surface here. The pores are very minute, so you can't actually feel them. With Tremedes, you can actually, there's a texture underneath. It doesn't mark when you scratch it, it doesn't really mark it, but, but it has a texture, it has tiny pores there, and it's usually snow white until they start aging and then they darken up. Next slide. Again, many, um, if you look at the clinical trials, the number of clinical trials, stomach cancer 21, colorectal 9, esophageal, and so forth. So. Uh, if you add up all the people that have been in these clinical trials, and, and there are more than this now. This was, this was just summarized from this one article. Um, but there's, there are probably, uh, in these clinical trials, cancer taking mushroom extracts to see that it can reduce nausea from chemo. It can reduce uh, fatigue from our hair falling out. So it really does give our, strengthen our immune system when the mushroom extract is taken with chemotherapy. Unfortunately, I would love to see a, a study where it's just, it's just mushroom extract versus chemotherapy. A, a mushroom extract in a good diet versus, versus chemotherapy in a standard diet. I would love to see a test. And, and frankly, I think that this arm over here would do better. I mean, that's my bias, but, but I tend to believe that uh, based on what I've seen. Uh, but anyway, t I mean, it makes perfect sense. I mean, if, you if you're taking chemotherapy, that is a huge hit. It may kill some cancer cells, but it's a huge hit on your immune system. I mean, it's going to trash your, your uh, immune stem cells, and, and you're going to get neutropenia, and your immune system is not going to be respond, is not going to be able to respond to the cancer as well. So it, it really is, to me, it's, it's irrational to even use chemotherapy. Personally, I think that's... That's true. Uh, but it's certainly more rational if you're going to use chemotherapy to take a lot of, of this mushroom medicine, high beta glucan. It's, it makes a lot of sense. And, and that's what the, the clinical trials show, that it really can help 
uh, counteract the side effects of the chemo and keep our immune system strong during the chemo. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Let's go on to beautiful, beautiful uh, shiitake. So wonderful. Pretty easy to grow. By the way, you can grow shiitake on straw, but it doesn't produce as many fruiting bodies, and probably the beta-glucan content is lower. Uh, but it's faster. You can get faster fruiting bodies than if you grow it on wood. Next slide. Um, yeah, antiviral, hepato, many of these mushrooms are hepatoprotective. There are plenty of studies showing that it protects your kidneys and internal organs your, and your liver. Uh, can help pre prevent uh, ulcers. Some of these mushrooms like shiitake, for instance, extracts, or just eating them every day. You know, what's, what's the amount of fruiting by? People always ask me, well, if I don't want the byproduct, can I just eat shiitake every day? And certainly, you know, well, what's the dose? Okay, take, you know, I mean, I can, I can eat 20 shiitake fruiting bodies. I've done it. If they're grilled with a nice sauce on it, oh my God, they're just, they're in, they're just irresistible, uh, to me anyway. So I've overeaten on them a number of times. So, but how many do you eat for good immune effects? Probably two or three fruiting bodies per day is plenty. You're getting a lot of uh, beta-glucans. Um, so, and, and cholesterol regulating. Shiitake is very good at cholesterol regulation. Next, next slide. Uh, okay, C clinical trials. Next slide. I, I, I pretty much talked about that. Rishi. Rishi has so many interesting uh, traditional. Uh, next slide. Uh, cultural has so many interesting cultural aspects to it. Uh, it's been part of the culture for so long. Uh, millions of people. People still use it there. You, if you go into a Chinese herb shop, which I do frequently, just to see what they've got going. Uh, I'm also a, a licensed acupuncturist, so <clears throat> I know the herbs. I go into like Chinatown or in Oakland. I go in, in there and and uh, you know l see what they've got, their, their herbs they've got, how fresh they are, and you always you always see lots of reishi fruiting bodies in there. So that's probably one of the most important mushroom species that they use. But if you go into a Chinese herb shop and look at the quality, I mean, so many times I've gone into a Chinese herb shop and there's li they're literally full of uh, fly larvae, and, and, and they just, you know, some of them you pick them up and there's just nothing there. They're all hollow inside, like David was reading about. <laughs> they're, they're literally, and I, I put them on my shelf. I love the way they look. So I put them, you know, I get them and I put them all on my shelf, different species, black ones, and, and, and there's this big one like this, and I put, uh, such one actually, I put them up there. You know, a few months later, I'm looking at them and, and I'm noticing that there are a few little flies flying around, and I pick one up, and you know, there's just nothing there. It's it's like it's it's like the outer outer sh skin. That's it. That's all that was there. And the rest of it, you pick it up, and the powder falls down. So they, you know, they really. So if you want to preserve them for a while, I recommend freezing them for like a, two or three days. Put them in the freezer for several days, if you're going to store them. And that's what I have to do. And I start seeing, I, I just put them all in the freezer for a few days, and then, then they'll last for another few months. And I don't know how they get reinfected, but, but typically they're always eating. I've always had some mushroom flies in my office. Next slide. Well, I'm okay with that. Next slide. There are different, oh, back, back to this one. You know, the, the, this came out of a Chinese herb shop. So there, there's black ones, and there's different shapes, and... Um, the, the completely round one is sit, th this one. See this great big one here that's not, not um, bifurcated here or there's no lobe and unlobed. This one is Ganoderma sichuanense. I did the DNA on this one. I know that's sichuanense. And, and the one that has the kind of the powder on the top, this one turned out is kind of, there's a lot of variability in cap shape. So you can't count on cap shape 100% for ID. But but this one here turned out to be the most common one that you find in Chinese herb shops is definitely Ganoderma um, lingzhur. Uh, it used to be called Ganoderma lucidum, and now that is only applied to the European species. So they've had to switch now um, to, and then they made up this new name, Ganoderma lingzhur, for the most commonly cultivated reishi in, in Asia. Next slide. Uh, all these all these biological effects from reishi, even pain relief, 
antioxidants, of course, uh, antihypertensive. They use it for cardiovascular issues. So reishi is, pro is the number one selling mushroom in the trade. But now, actually, um, recently, uh, lion's mane is really coming up and rivaling reishi as, a po as the most popular mushroom. But all these different benefits, expectorant, anti-cough, uh, central, you know, they've proven central depressant activity, so calming the spirit uh, as an anxiolytic. Next, next slide. So, so many, uh, th these are the traditional um, indications. So, again, you can look at the slideshow on YouTube, and, and I, I do the talk as well, but I, but I um, focus more on, on pretty much every bullet point, practically. So, next slide. You can, you can look at that. Here is a uh, Ganoderma sugi here, and this this is that tender edge I was talking about that you can take pieces off and you can actually eat it. Uh, it's really strong, so um, but they they thought that this part here was the part that that uh, this uh, that really did have magical properties of some kind. This is a 17-pound one that we found up on an old hemlock tree. Next slide. Maitake isn't one of the top ones, but it does have some research on it. A couple of clinical trials. That they're a delicious edible that do have a pretty good content of beta-glucan. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, poria is a sclerotium that they cut, and they use it as a Chinese medicine. So th this is very common in Chinese prescriptions. Next, li next slide. Uh, next slide. Let's, I'm just going to show you. Here's... Here's the cordyceps I was talking about with the caterpillar and the fruiting body, the mycelium. Um, so kidney protective effects are really the, probably what I would go for. There are no studies that really support the, the um, you know, to increase sexuality, to incre increase your performance in sports or stuff. There are no clinical trials on, the, on those. Next slide. So again, it's cultural. Uh, other other things. Next slide. I'm just going to show you some other species here before we finish. Next slide. Oyster is really well known to, to have a, um, a statin-like compound that's very similar in chemical makeup to, to lovastatin. And so if you eat, but you have to eat a lot of it to get that cholesterol lowering effect. But because of the fiber, I think that if you, you know, if you have cholesterol problems, certainly uh, oyster mushrooms can be one of the best choices. Next slide. Schizophyllum, I'm, I really love this one. Schizophyllum is, uh, you know, these aren't true gills here. They call them schizophyllum split leaf because when they, when they mature, these ridges, when they mature, they split open and then the spores are released out of those, out of, out of the splits here. And this grows in California. I don't know if it grows here or not, but in the Rockies, but we have quite a bit of it. I've seen some logs covered with it around Davis. Uh, and, and they actually cultivate it in Indonesia, and it's an important food source. And in India, China, Asia, parts of Asia, and, and they make loaves out of it. It's very, it's kind of meaty tasting and uma, umami flavored, and, and so they call it tiny oyster too. So you can pound it with fish sauce, and you can make all kinds of dishes out of it. and <coughs> and. Uh, uh, I like it. I like the flavor of it. it. And when it's young and tender, it is actually quite nice. You can get dried fruiting bodies on eBay. You can buy big bags of, of dried uh, split gill on eBay and soak them overnight. Use the soak water or pour it off. Maybe maybe there's some pesticides and herbicides in there you want to get rid of. You know, pour it off. You don't know where it was grown or where it's coming from. But uh, <coughs> that's one big disadvantage of schizophyllum because, frankly, Buying herbs from a Chinese herb shop, buying mushroom, dried mushrooms from a Chinese herb shop is, let's face it, it's, it's a bit, uh, there, there's some unknowns there, let's put it that way. How was it grown? Where was it grown? Um, it, did it take up any heavy metals and so forth? Next slide. Here's the dish. They call it, they call it uh, jamur grigat, and it's a, considered a delicacy. It's got a meaty texture with earthy and pleasant aromas. I've made it. It's good. Next slide. Next slide. It's one of the ones that have really been studied for its anti-tumor, anti-cancer effects. Honey mushroom <laughs> is a, that's another really interesting um, mushroom that, that is in Chinese medicine. It's used for its anti-hypertensive effects, for for its um, anti 
epileptic effects, so for ticks, for epilepsy, convulsions, this is one of the main medicines that they use. Next slide. And, and other things. So it is considered an important medicine. Next slide. And it turns out that there's a Chinese herb called gastrodia, which is an orchid. And here is the tuber of the orchid. And so they cut, they cultivate these. They couldn't cultivate it for a long time. These are really expensive. And this is the main Chinese herb that's used for convulsions, epilepsy. If you have an epilepsy form, you go to a Chinese uh, herbalist, they're going to give you a formula with, with gastrodia in it. So they tried to, and because it's rare in the wild, they tried to cultivate it because it's so valuable, so expensive. They couldn't cultivate it. Then they found that it would only grow in the presence of our malaria malaria. So it's only going to grow when the mushroom is around. <coughs> so then, uh, then they start cultivating. But then the next step is, and then they produce these big things. The next step was they found that most of the anticonvulsant activity and most of the active compounds were produced by the fungi and not by the, by the orchid. So again, the fungi is just a storehouse it's a, you know, of producing all these incredible active compounds. That, that, and then they, in, in their collaboration with green plants in the leaves, in the roots, that protects the plant against bacterial invasion, for one thing. Uh, and so when we th we're brewing an herb or we're brewing, uh, you know, uh, something like a, even a, a mushroom, you know, the activity, they, they just produce so many active compounds. That's my point. Next slide. So that's kind of a fun story. Um, the quinine conch, panacea mushroom, was known to the, this is one that was known to the ancient Greeks. It was in the pharmacopoeia, uh, pharmacopoeias, it was in Dioscorides, it was in the um, pharmacy shops, drug shops, for about 1,600 years. An extract of this mushroom was in, was in, the, in the pharmacies. Like, if, like in the 1600s, you go into the pharmacy shop and there'd be an old time pharmacist there with all these bottles of, of herb extracts and mushroom, they would have, foam, they would have, uh, this is Larissa Foamies now, I guess, uh, they would have quinine conch in there. Uh, it's a very unique uh, mushroom. If you've ever taken a piece of it and, and sucked on it or chewed on it, you can really taste bitter, you can taste sweet, salty, and it's a little bit acrid, so it's, it's like a five flavors herb that they use in Chinese medicine. So it is an amazing medicine, unfortunately it's, it's rather difficult to access. That's the main problem with it. So it does have an incredible, it has the longest history of any medicinal mushroom in Western cultures. Next slide. And it was used, it was shot off with rifles, the big fruiting bodies they grow on, maybe old growth. Uh, and I know only, I've only seen one fruiting body in, in, uh, in Santa Cruz in the whole time I lived there uh, on an old growth dug fir where, where there was a lightning strike or something or a, a damage up high up in the in the trunk, and there was this old, uh, old, you know, conch growing up, growing up there that was very, very old, many years old. So they're not, they're hard to find. That's the problem. But in the old days, in the like early 20th century, they would shoot them off with rifles up high, and they would extract that and make a tincture, and that and was supposed to be good for malaria. So it was used as a quinine substitute. Next slide. Chaga, another really fascinating mushroom. You know, it, it's a classic mushroom fruiting body from um, all over, you know, the northern hemisphere, pretty much. I mean, it grows up, if you go high enough, even on the west coast of Canada, it's growing up there in Alaska. It's growing up there all the way to the east coast, all throughout Europe. So it grows up high, uh, you know, very n north uh, on a lot of it. I know they do grow on other trees, but they grow on birch and especially around Vermont where I was harvesting, they grow on yellow birch. Uh, and, and I did a lot of research for my book, so if you want to know more about chaga, the cultural, the, the, the sustainability, for it because a lot of people are harvesting it now, uh, the bottom line is it's probably sustainable. There's so, so many millions of acres of trees up there that, that it, it does, it a, is actually a parasite. It attacks the weaker trees 
and it could take up to 80 years though to, before they, the tree dies. So there's some type of symbiosis going on there. That's what I'm convinced of. You know, if there's a damage to the tree, you'll see one of these sclerotium coming out and growing out of the tree. I would argue, and it's filled up with betulinic acid that it extracts from the tree. Why does it do that? What, what's, what's the fitness ex uh, advantage? I think it protects the tree. I think it's as an anti, because betulinic acid, like if you break open a chaga, it's yellow inside. That's the betulinic acid that is extracted from the tree. So my, se my sense of it is that the mushroom is living in, in, in some type of relationship with the tree. We know that, that they're in a lot of trees up there, but they don't kill them for up to 80 years. So they can, so they're not true parasites in the sense that they just attack them and kill them. There's something else going on there. But anyway, uh, be that as it may, it, it is one of the most important anti-cancer and, can and cancer care program remedies that are known in Scandinavia and Russia uh, and have been used for a long, long time. And I've got some stories about it in my book again. Uh, but they also use another good benefit of chaga is for gastric ulcer. They use it a lot for, as a tea for, for preventing ga gastritis, stomach uh, inflammation, and also for curing uh, gastric ulcer. So this, this is very common use in, in Russia. Next slide. Next slide. Lion's mane. Um, it's, a, it's a really delicious, wonderful to find. Uh, these other ones have a similar chemistry, but they're just not as meaty and, and solid as, as the Arenaceous is. And, and they contain diterpenes. So again, all mushrooms, the, the active compounds are the cell wall components that I've discussed, phenolic compounds, which are antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and terpenes. So all mushrooms have a wide variety of terpene compounds. Terpenes are, are simply more complex hydrocarbons with a lot of substituent groups on them, and they have all kinds of functions on our nervous system. Uh, so there are monoterpenes that are found in essential oils. Uh, those are very volatile because they're small molecules. Then there's diterpenes, which are not so volatile, and they tend to be bitter. Well, that's what the, the lion's mane contains, mainly diterpenes that are rather unique, and they have been shown in uh, laboratory and animal studies to promote nerve growth, nerve regeneration. And so that's why there's so much... Uh, interest in lion's mane today, I think. That's why there's so much interest, because of this unique ability to act as a nootropic or a nerve rebuilding uh, uh, type of medicine. The other one that we know a lot about, and there's increasing amount of research that is expanding all the time, is psilocybin. So s my, by microdosing, it actually, there's, there's recent research that show that it can untangle tangled areas in our brain, that it can strengthen connection between the palisade cells, the pyramidal cells in our cortex, uh, strengthen them and make them um, more, uh, I don't know, more like a superhighway, that the impulse can travel more, more efficiently. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so, and also to stimulate glia cells. So glia, glial cells in our brain is part of our nervous system a cleanup crew, if you will. And so it activates, it binds to those, binds to serotonin receptors and activates those to re for repair and maintenance of our brain, which is, of course, quite important uh, because there's a lot of damage that can happen up there, uh, free radicals and, and, uh, and because of our diet and toxicity and so forth. So, but lion's mane is, be is being hotly studied. There are no clinical trials I mean, people are taking it for, okay, I'm just going to improve my memory. It's going to, if I've got Alzheimer's, it's going to reverse that. Uh, if, if I've got some nerve damage, you know, it's going to repair that. No, we have no clinical trial. We have no evidence that that can happen. But we do know that by imbibing the diterpenes in lion's mane, it can stimulate nerve growth factor, and it can proliferate nerve cells to grow and, and connect together. We do know that. And, and in animals as well, but not in humans. So this is, this is a, 
work in progress to study on lion's mane, but it has become one of the most important. It also is very, very good, again, for, for gastritis and for any kind of stomach irritation, uh, lion's mane. And lion's mane is incredibly important and popular in Asia and China. Literally, it's one of the very, very top sellers in China is lion's mane. And people take it as a daily adaptogen, as a tonic um, to, to protect this, the stomach and the GI tract. Uh, so so this, this literally is here now, too. It's one of the most popular. But in Asia and China, this is the most important medicinal species out there besides reishi. And it's the same here now. Next slide. So, you know, there's different research on it. Next slide. I'm just going to show you a couple other species here. Um, next slide. Quality control, I'm going to mention the starch test. The starch, the iodine, the iodine test has been known for a long time to be the best way to see, to detect starch, the starch molecule. The iodine, the starch molecule has spaces between the, gluc the glucans, and when you put iodine in there, the iodine, um, you know, molecule binds into that space, and then it and then it starts to reflect the, the blue wavelength. And so, if the, if you have, uh, say, you take two capsules of lion's mane uh, product uh, that you buy from the shelf, always test it, a hundred percent test it. Just get a bottle of iodine from Amazon or wherever. I use J. Crow's Lugol solution. This has been great. And so you, you take your capsules and put it in a glass or something, stir it up. It should be kind of an amber color like this. That's what you should see if there's no starch. If you put the, and then put about 10 drops of iodine in there, if it immediately turns blue like this, that means it's loaded with starch. If it, so if it, if it go after a couple minutes, but it goes back to kind of this color, then it's got a little starch in it. And if it stays blue like that though, then it's got probably 40 to 60% starch in there. And we don't want to pay for brown rice extract. You know, some of these lion mane pill, bottle of pills, the popular ones, you're talking 30 bucks for a bottle of capsules. That's not the way to go. Powders are much better. You're going to get a lot more for your money out of the powders. So there are quite a few companies that sell powders, or bottles of powders, or bags of powders. You can put them in capsules for the, for the masses, because we're so used to capsules. But I'm a big fan of powders. They're just so much easier to take. Put it in a smoothie, mix a little bit in, in a water, and drink it, or tea, or whatever. And you can fortify it, or put it in your food. If it turns purple, then it's got a lot of glycogen in it. That's that mushroom starch, if you will. <coughs> this has some immunomodulating effects, but starch has no immunomodulating effects. The leading brand is going to tell you that, well, yes, there's still a lot of rice in the product if you buy a capsule of lion's mane, but the rice is infused with the, with the mushroom compounds. That's, that's their standard line, but, but I don't, but if it has no beta-glucans, it has no terpenes or phenolics, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't have the activity that I'm looking for. So anyway, that's something about products. Next slide. Let's just look at a couple more species. Um, th this is a very popular, th this, the, um, the um, what do they call it, sun agaric, they call it, sun agaric. Uh, is a very popular mushroom in Chinese herb shops. You can find it as an anti-cancer mushroom, protects the kidneys and so forth. And uh, it's Agaricus subrufescens. But uh, it's for, so it's a red staining agaric, basically. So any, my sense is that any red staining agarics that you would find, you know, out there, subrutalescence or whatever, those probably are a very similar medicine to the, the, to the cultivated one here. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I re I've read various reports that this may have gotten loose in the East Coast and it's growing out there. Do you know anything about that, David? Is it? Yeah. Right, but you don't know if it got out anywhere and could have. Anyway, any red staining agaric, in my opinion, is, is pretty much the same medicine. Next slide. Corn smut, Ustilago, used to be used as a medicine because it, it has a, a smooth muscle contracting ability. So it was actually a tincture of corn smut was used 
uh, in, in medicine in the early 1900s for um, postpartum to stop bleeding. So that's kind of interesting. Have you ever eaten corn smut? How many, how many people have eaten it? Delicious, right? It tastes kind of like a cross between corn and mushroom flavor. Uh, I went to the Midwest one time, and the, you know, the field, we went over to an organic field, and the stuff was just everywhere. So we gathered quite a bit of it and, and cooked it up and with some onions and garlic and, and, uh, and then made tacos out of it. And th they're quite delicious, really. I, I like it. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a delicacy in Mexico and other parts of the world. Next slide. Wood ear, one of my all-time favorites. This, this I took in the Amazon. This picture was in the Amazon. Um, I went down there in the fall, of he fall here, uh, a couple of times to Peru, out in, the, out in the wilds of Peru and in the Amazon. And the logs there were just covered with wood ear from one end to the other. And then these, they would cut these trees and put, put them down on the ground. They're about this tall, um, you know, so that you can walk because it would flood. It would, it would basically pour down rain almost every day. And it also it was like, you know, 90 degrees and pouring down rain every day. And so you'd walk on these rounds, and I'd look down, and there were just like so many rishi-like mushrooms growing up on every single round. And really interesting ones with very long stems and small little cap. Uh, and those were wonderful to see. Uh, but, but the wood ear, boy, talk about a, an abundance of food there. Next slide. Another slide of the same, same one. It's used for a lot of different things in medicine, Chinese medicine, to increase physical and mental energy, uh, slow uterine bleeding. A lot of these jelly fungi were, are known to um, lessen the uh, coagulability. So if you're prone to abnormal clotting, they, they u do use it for that. Um, uh, ease abdominal pain, they used it for low back pain, debility after childbirth, muscle spasms, poor circulation, and clear, clears phlegm and benefits the lungs. So they use wood ear, dif the different kinds of wood ear. I, I described the two or three different types in my book, but th these are widely used in Chinese medicine, not only for food, but al also for medicine. Next slide. Uh, and this, this was taken up by Rocky Mountain National Park. This is the one year that I can brag. I always, I, just this memory is so vivid. Growing in among the vaccinium <coughs> and, you know, going into, <coughs> going up there looking for porcini. This is years and years ago before it became really popular. Driving up the, the, the hill and elevation, I started seeing porcini by the side of the road. Pulled into a small roadside um, picnic stop and there were all these peop people picnicking at the picnic tables and then I looked down and there were like literally hundreds of, <laughs> of bow leaf buttons growing all around them and they weren't paying any attention to them. They were just eating their lunch and I was going, all, you know, and you couldn't walk without stepping on them. So that was probably my favorite you know, find of all time. But they do have, can they do, there is some in vivo and in vitro studies showing an anti-cancer effect. And again, the stem is higher in the beta-glucans than the cap. So they, they, this is really good medicine in many ways, of course. Next slide. And the red-belted polypore, Fomatopsis uh, pinacola. Uh, th this one grows on dug fir in our area. Pretty common. Uh, it was used by early American physicians in the 19th century for intermittent fevers, chronic diarrhea, neuralgia, nervous headaches, excessive urination, jaundice, so it benefits the liver supposedly, and to counteract tuberculosis. So this was considered a pretty good medicine by early American physicians. Next slide. Our next slide, fly agaric, which, um, fly agaric was used mainly as a mother tincture, in a mother tincture form for, uh, against epilepsy. So it is a pretty commonly used uh, homeopathic. Now, uh, as far as, as other things, you know, it's got, uh, as David was discussing, I don't know what I can add, just that, that you know, I I've, I've delved into the research and the, and the literature pretty deeply and wrote quite a bit on Amanita for my book and then ended up cutting some of it because a couple of my reviewers were saying, you're, you know, don't, don't, you, you know, you, you're over, 
you're over, um, you know, th enthusiastic about, about Amanita muscaria. And I am because of the cultural uses and the history and, you know, the Santa Claus thing and all these, all these other. And Soma, what, what is Soma? You know, that's, you, as everybody know, what, heard of the word Soma? It's basically the Rig Vedas, you know, the, of the, the Vedic script, in the Vedic scriptures 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. Uh, so, so they say, you read these verses, they're all in verse, and you read the verses, um, I, 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 I kissed the sky, I must have been eating Soma, or drinking Soma, and, and you know, I'm, I, I, um, I, I see God, I must have been drinking Soma. And so Gordon Wasson uh, posited that, that this was Soma. And, and there are many candidates. There's a Fedra sinensis. There's, there, you know, there's, there's other candidates. But when it comes down to it, actually at the end of his life, after he published his book, I read, read one of his short articles saying that it probably is not Amanita muscaria because this, this is not a sea god type of mushroom. This is not a hallucinogen. This is not a mushroom where you'll say, this is an amazing spiritual experience. And, and, the, and even today, they use it as an inebriant in... In, up in, up in uh, Siberia in the east. They, they still use it as an inebriant and, and there are many stories about how when you drink it or you eat it, you, you either, you know, it depends on your, the set and setting, how, how it'll hit you, but many people, they get very gay and they start singing and dancing and they get giddy and, and it, it really does sound just like an inebriant from what I can, all the reading that I've done on it. Um, and, and, you know, as far as medicine goes, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that you can really um, point at it as an important medicinal species. Uh, edible, yes, because it's good texture, because David pointed out it's so abundant in many areas. And it is high in protein, beta-glucans, and other beneficial compounds. But as far as the, you know, inebriating compounds, does that have a medicinal effect? Uh, I haven't really discovered that yet. Um, so that might be something to try. Tincture it up and microdose with it. Might be interesting. Yeah, but be careful because it does have uh, some toxic compounds in there. Okay, next slide. And there seems to be quite, a, the one thing about Amanita muscaria is that um, I think that the, the amount of active compounds have, do vary from, from area to area, probably. And so you really can't count on eating a certain amount and you're going to get the same effect every time. That's one thing about it. It's a wild mushroom and there are many, many different um, populations of it that have genetic variation. So, and you, obviously you don't want to mistake it for the death cap. Uh, next, but when we're talking about leaching it, can you, you know, the, the compounds, the, the inebriating compounds and the toxic compounds in Amanita muscaria are very water soluble. So therefore you can leach it easily and get them out. But with the death cap, these are, pro these are protein, these are amino acid like compounds. These are complex proteins. Um, the, uh, so, so you cannot leach them out. You can cook them, but they're still going to be there. Milk thistle is, yeah, next slide, I think is, a, is a, do I have, yeah. Now milk thistle, the seed coating of the milk thistle is the only species used that has a, a flavonolignin complex in, in the seed coating only called uh, salimarin or salibinin is the individual compound, one of them. And what they found was in Germany, the chemists, when they ground this up and extracted the yellow pigments out of there, the salimarin, and injected it into animals after, after they ate Amanita phylloides, it actually saved their lives and protected their livers. So this, this is another longer discussion, but, but basically the salimarin is, not, is a very protective compound for the liver. It's used for counteracting hepatitis, for generally protecting the liver, like you can go out and get a milk thistle, 80% salimarin supplement and take that daily to protect your liver. If you're a drinker, if you're taking pharmaceuticals, uh, and you want to protect your liver and kidneys, then taking this supplement daily can help. 
can be very protective. And it's a powerful antioxidant for your liver and kidneys and anti-inflammatory. Uh, but the, the caveat is that the, the active compounds are very poorly uh, absorbable by our body. We cannot, we only can absorb about 10, 15 percent of the medicine. And therefore, like in, in Asia, in, in, uh, in Europe, the way they've been able to save, because um, Amanita phylloides poisoning is much more common in, in Europe than it is in here because they eat so many more mushrooms. And uh, so they do it IV. They, they administer it IV. And that has saved a lot of lives over the years. Um, so you have to, if you buy a supplement, it has to be um, complex with phosphatidylcholine, which is a bioenhancer. It helps our body absorb the active compound. Okay, so I think that's the last slide anyway. First polypore, another one. But I'll stop there. Thank you.